And, um, so yeah, so I was the worked on it with a team of people on curriculum. And at first, like Anna said, we thought they might have computer labs, but come to find out they were 100% on phones, mostly. So um, we had to make, we learned a lot about designing curriculum for phones. Um, let's go to the next slide. So one of the ways, I know a lot of people don't, a lot of students don't have internet and I saw that this one person from Nepal he said they have lack of internet so one of the ways to use your phone with text messaging is to get a text program and I have three here I'm just going to go through them very quickly and when we get into the breakout rooms you can ask me more question um, a lot of students globally have whatsapp already on their phone and they use it for texting so if they have it on their phone already you can use it um, Remind is a U.S.-based company. Many U.S. students in the U.S. have Remind with their K-12 students, so they already might have the app on their phone. And the third one is Facebook groups. A lot of students are familiar with Facebook. What's important in asynchronous learning is that you get the students where they need to be. And in my case, when I teach online, I use all three of these ways of connecting with my students because everybody uses a different way of connecting. So I duplicate my messages three times to the students in these various different modalities. Okay. Um, something we learned very quickly is that we have to teach the students to use their phone in landscape mode because you get more real estate on your phone. Typically, students are used to using the portrait. That's how they text and do most of their work. So we had to teach them to use it landscape. And we learned very quickly that 30-point type was easy to read on the phone. So you have to think about your slide real estate when you're making curriculum for phones. Um, and so 30-point type, you can go down to 28, but 30 is best. And when you take a photo, it needs to be really visual and it needs to be something the students need to see because you can't use more than one or two photos on a screen. Um, and as Anna said, we teach the students how to use the microphone and that's one of the first lessons we do. Um, so this is a Zoom. And before Anna was showing you a big blue button and this is the Zoom uh, screen. So we have different buttons for phones and computers. So you, most of your students will be on the phone. So you, on Zoom, you really can't show this unless you grab a screenshot of it. So there's a screenshot for you. You can just use that. And we would actually make an activity of this. And here's the activity. Jose asked Mark to mute his microphone. And then he would mute it. And then Jose asked Mark to unmute his microphone and he would unmute it. And we have the students do that Throughout the class, everybody telling to mute or unmute, they learn the word mute, they learn the word unmute, and they also learn how to operate their microphone. And we did the same thing with the video, um, have each member turn on and off and stop their video so that the students would learn. And we, this was very important because everybody wanted to come on with their video and that takes a lot of bandwidth and then we would have problems with the program crashing. So um, we just have students practice turning it on, turning it off, and we just go around the whole room. And you might, for the one first class, the onboarding class, that might be what you do for the class, is teaching them the digital literacy skills necessary for the conferencing tool. So, and then the third thing is the chat box. So in, um, you don't assume your students know how to use a chat box. We learned that. So we have to, you have to kind of teach them how to use it. Um, I use the chat box to type in the key points. Um, students can introduce themselves in the chat box as a first activity, and then you can show them how they can add files and how they can send things and um, play a game, see who can raise their hand the fastest. That teaches students how to use the participant list to raise their hand, and it teaches them etiquette as well. And then also in the participant button, there is a slow down button. So I always teach the students how to use the slow down button by speaking really, really fast so they can't understand me at all and they have to ask me to slow down. So um, that is a very good activity to use as well and have the students practice using the chat box until they, they're using it well. 
In Upskilling New Americans report, and we're going to put the link in the chat box for you, we have, we have shown how you can take face-to-face -face activities and turn them into virtual classroom activities. I'm not going to go through all of them here, but a few of them, for example, icebreakers. <clears throat> Instructors and students use their video camera, emoticons, and polls. And in uh, Zoom, emoticons is called reactions, I believe. Um, role play and small group practice you do in breakout rooms. And your uh, handouts in Word, you have to convert them to Google Slides. And again, like I said, make sure the font is at least 30 point. So these are some of my tips is to start out slow and simplify. Um, really important one is to practice one new tool at a time. You know, you're going to get People are <clears throat> talking about all these different tools now because there are so many out there, but you can't use them all at one time and expect that your students are going to learn those tools. So I would suggest using one tool at a time and you decide from all the tools you'll see, you pick out which you think is the best tool for your learners at this time and use it until the students really understand how it works. Um, develop small group projects that end with groups presenting. Now that we don't live in the four walls right now, think of the classroom as an open-ended place and students can actually present their work. Um, give less homework. Students are having a hard time focusing and with their kids at home, they're distracted. Um, I really think that the homework now should be done in the Zoom room with your students when you're in class with them and then outside of class, they're just practicing what you learned. And the last thing is, don't worry about failing. Failing will make you more successful. If it doesn't start out, start out perfect, that's OK. Thanks, Susan. I'm, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions at this point. Um, it looks like we have, we have a comment from um, Padam on live class. Some students mute audio and video and go away from live classes. Are there any methods to check um, whether or not they're online? My suggestion is to, to uh, ask them a question and if they don't answer, they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. Hey, I, I noticed um, a couple slides back. You talked about using the breakout room of Zoom. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you've used that to do role play and like how you've made sure that the instructions that you give actually get carried out if you're not in the breakout room with the students? So on the webinar, we, of course, we don't have breakout rooms, but on, on a Zoom meeting, you do have breakout rooms and on big blue button, you have breakout rooms. And the teacher can go just like you when you do group work in the classroom, in breakout rooms, you can go from room to room and see what the students are doing. Um, you can also require the students to do something in the room that they bring back to the whole class when they come out of the breakout room. Okay, great. Um, a couple more questions. Um, do you include, what kind of strategies do you include or, or provide for them around study time? Um, or, you know, are, do you, do you, do you do anything around that sort of more affect, affective support or, or success skills that students need to succeed in this kind of learning? Well, I think um, you have to take it small bits because the students are distracted and they don't have a lot of study time and you can't say to them, you know, their kids are home. And so if they have three or four kids and they're homeschooling their kids, I found that some of my students, they don't have any time to get on the phone to do a Zoom class because they're, they're their kids are using it all the time because they have to do their class that way. So you really need to think about how much time you're going to do synchronously and then maybe make more asynchronous work with very a lot of scaffolding along the way. And what do you mean by that, Susan? What, what would constitute scaffolding? So helping the students going slow, but slow, slowly, giving them one small activity, and then checking up on them constantly through text messaging to see if they're doing it or what problems they're having. Most cases that I've found with students, when they don't do the work you want them to do, it's because they don't know how. Uh -huh. So a lot of this proactive support that that mm -hmm. Anna was talking about in her presentation. Yes. Um, uh, Jennifer um, Klumpen asks, um, have you taught Zoom classes to mixed level ESL students before? 
Um, I'm actually teaching a class right now. I do it as a volunteer. And they come from all of my classes that I've ever had. And some of them are very beginning and some of them are quite advanced. So I have them do peer-to-peer -peer support in that case to help out each other. Is that synchronous peer-to-peer -peer support or is that working um, through? Well, it depends. Sometimes it's synchronous. Sometimes I put them in breakout rooms and have them, I, I strategically put them together in breakout rooms and have them help each other. And sometimes I ask them to do a project together. So it's both synchronous and asynchronous. Okay, great. Um, one of the things that, that, didn't, that Anna didn't have time to talk about in her presentation, and I'm also wondering about your instruction is, to what extent are you using the home language and literacies of students in some of this support in order to make the English language instruction accessible virtually? You know, that's a question I've had before, but uh, most of my students are re read and write in English quite, I mean, they, they don't have a literacy problem. But I have taught literacy students before, not remotely though. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, in, and the way I always operate is if students need to use the home language to understand what they need to do, it's okay. But that their work should be produced in English. Right. And I know that um, in the onboarding section, some of those, those support people did have home language, shared, uh, shared home language with some of the students. And I believe, Anna, you can chat a response if I've got this wrong, but I believe that home language was useful to some extent with that, that onboarding. Okay, so I think you have one last slide here, Susan. Yeah, and I'm gonna go through these, but these are just apps that you can use to um, help uh, get your students enjoying, enjoying learning online. And um, I'll go through them, but um, they, Quizlet is a great tool for vocabulary and also good for literacy students because you could put one word on a card and teach that to the students. Um, Flipgrid is an audio video bulletin board that you can use to have your students uh, develop their conversation and pronunciation skills. Kahoot and quizzes are games. You can easily make games for the class. Breaking News English, I mean, Breaking News Reading is um, like Newzella, but it's free, <laughs> completely free. And Newzella is also free now for until June, but this is always free. The daily check-in form is a very simple Google form that you can use. You can copy it. All of these are links, and you can copy the daily check-in form from Jody Barker, and you can just customize it for yourself. And Wakelet is a uh, curation uh, web curation tool that allows you to create step-by-step -step asynchronous lessons so that your students can follow. 